Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Dr. Beth McDougall. And today I have the special pleasure of introducing our next guest, Dr. Katie Hendricks, an evolutionary catalyst and freelance mentor, has been a pioneer in the field of body intelligence and conscious loving for 50 years. Co-author of 12 books, her work explores the how of consciousness and the structures and practices that befriend and transform fear into presence, relational authenticity, and resonant collaboration. And it's a huge honor for me to be sitting here with you, um, Dr. Katie Hendricks, because I actually have been influenced by your work since the late 1980s. I know, a lifetime ago. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And it's just, it's your work's been influential in my own life and really in my relationships. And it's been so beneficial. I read your books, my my then partner read your books, and it was really important, you know, kind of opening for us in our communication and all of that. And so I'm grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you. I think back then we wrote the first relationship book that was written by two people who work together and are and we are still together um, in contrast to other relationship experts who are both either appearing solo and generally as a man or have um, you know were together and are not together. So I think that speaks also to the value of the practices that we discovered through our own just daily what's going to work. And then they seem to work so well, we started sharing with others. And that's where all of this has come from. Wow. I am that, yes, a beautiful, beautiful legacy that you've left for all of us. Hmm. And, you know, I'm a physician and uh, I see people with chronic illness and just complex medical conditions. And so often it's as if their body is really trying to tell them things. And, it, you know, so I just, I, I appreciate how you've moved into embodiment work practices and presencing, even coining that as a term now, uh, because I feel like, you know, the person, when they're home in the body, they can begin to detect subtle things before they manifest in, in deeper ways and, you know, in serious disease. And yes. it just, you know, it allows people to just have that kind of quicker feedback that, you know, can help them kind of course correct in their life and, and clear out stuck energy and all of that. And um, I, you know, so thank you for, for what you're doing mm. now. And, uh, and so, and I, I love now this, what you're talking about, the that one of the quickest ways to change your mind is to change your body. Yes. Maybe just dive in. Oh, yes. Yeah. I just would love to elaborate on that. We um, we wrote Conscious Loving, our, our primary relationship book in 1990, and we wrote a book called At the Speed of Life in 1994. And that is all about your body wisdom and how to take advantage of the resources that we all have, our breath, our movement, but primarily being able to give attention, curious attention to what's going on in your own body with a sense of reception and, and interest. Because the main thing that I see is that people are taught that their bodies are bad. Their bodies need to be controlled, that they're going to run amok, that, uh, and most people are detached from their experience from here down. They actually literally think this is where they live. And so they're cogitating and worrying and uh, running, but never actually dropping into this amazing wisdom that's right here for us if we approach it from curiosity. But most people approach it from what's wrong. And if there's something, if I tell people, pay attention to a body sensation, 
almost everybody is looking for where there's pain or tension, not just what's going on and what might I learn from that. So one of the big things that we teach people is that the body is an incredible resource. It's a treasure chest that most of us have just not opened. And that the primary move is to hmm, go in through your wonder brain, hmm, what's the message here? Or hmm, what is my body trying to tell me? But what people generally do then is to go back up into their head and like look at themselves. I remember asking in a group for people to notice their feet and a whole bunch of them just looked down, you know, like unless I can see it, it doesn't exist. But the primary move is if I take my attention from the inside and meet what I'm experiencing, that unlocks. So instead of looking at, oh, this is wrong and bad and judging it and having all of those cognitive ideas about it, I join it with my consciousness. And that's what opens the door for your body to say, oh, I'm scared or it, you know, you forgot to tell that person not to get so close to you or, you know, whatever. It's usually very direct and very quick. Or this pain is because you didn't, you know, make this choice instead of that choice. And so it can be very, very quick. And the other thing just from research that we know is that sensations from your body are your primary wisdom. They get to your brain four to 10 times faster than your cognitive thoughts. So your body gets there first. So if you let yourself welcome your body, you have resources uh, at, literally at your fingertips that uh, you wouldn't have otherwise. And so we ask people to like, one of the things I ask people to do is bodify. So when I say, what's going on? Or you say, how are you? people will usually go up to want to tell you a story about it. So, but if I say, could you just modify what's been going on? And I don't even need to define it more than that. They start moving or, you know, or, and then I can see and they can start to feel maybe where the blocks are or where, where the gaps are or what the message is. And so it's actually so quick and uh, so friendly that people don't quite trust it. Because we have this whole orientation of it has to be hard, no pain, no gain. You know, you have to push through it. Uh, and actually, it, from all of my work in all of these years, now I can make shifts so quickly that I don't have to go through the making myself feel bad in order to get the message. I can start getting the message from subtler and subtler signals, which I know is also a part of of your approach also. And it makes it much more fun. It's like being on an adventure of discovery rather than a, uh-oh, something's really wrong here. Right. Yeah. And it's just, it's a like real time feedback that you can then work with and, and uh, of course, correct. Or, you know, for me, I think about it as, as if you don't, if you aren't aware, you're just storing the kind of residue of, let's say, feelings related to an interaction with somebody or even even just body aware uh, sensations related to something you just ate or oh yes you just locked into that maybe doesn't have emf protection or well you know. or also you're you're starting to go into especially uh, in this part of the pandemic if i'm starting to move into a space i always check my body you know, is my body like, oh, yes, let's move in or uh-oh. And I always listen to that. Even though I may not know in the moment, I go, okay, I need a little bit more information and then I'll move and breathe and just kind of get curious. And then the information will come. It doesn't come on a ticker tape because our, our minds have this causality, A, B, C, D, but that's not the way the, the body works. The body works like, Ooh, pain over here, but it's actually related to over here because of something you did three days ago. And I want you to be doing this and all of that's happening at the same time. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, with, with so many people kind of having spent the majority of their life just in their head or out, not fully embodied or 
in those individuals where so much is accumulated within the body that it's now very uncomfortable to be in there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, layers and layers. Layers and layers. How do you begin to introduce someone to their body and kind of like help them befriend the body and, and embody further? Well, uh, what I would do is to listen to what are they here for? What do they want? And there's almost always a complaint because hardly anybody comes in for coaching because things are great and they want to have them be fabulous. So what I'll do is I'll listen. And then a key question that I think all of my coaches know is, how are you experiencing this in your body? And the answer isn't as important as this move. They have to go, hmm, oh, I'm I could be experiencing this in my body. And it leads to making pathways to their body. And then I watch to see what they're doing when, when I ask that question. And almost always there'll be some part that tightens or twists or folds up in some way. And then what I'll ask people to do is to do that a little more, because if they can make it bigger, they can shift it. So almost always people will get the message, stop doing that. What you're doing is wrong. Do this instead, or just relax. <laughs> you know, like you could do that <laughs> from a state of stress. But what I found is if people can just exaggerate it a little bit, they can take control of it. They can go, oh, I, I did this, it hurts more. Now, if I do this, it starts to dissipate. Oh so it's what I call turning the volume up and down. And uh, so I, I do my best to start where people are and to start interacting with them there so they can turn what's wrong into something that is a message that's an opening for them rather than something else to control. Because uh, most people, I don't think, realize that their bodies are just such an incredible treasure and don't really value their bodies. They think of it as a machine. There's a famous Edison quote, Thomas Edison, that the only purpose of your body is as a vehicle to carry your head from place to place. And you know, so many people think of that. But if if I can meet them with my curiosity, it activates their own curiosity that their bodies and their experience has value. Because almost anybody who's got layers of stuff in their body have been told or shown or demonstrated in the way that people interact with them that other people think there's something wrong with them. And it's either, it's almost always the too much issue, you're too loud, you're too big, you're too, and it's of people trying to get you to fit in rather than for you to express your own authenticity and your own genius in the world. So that switch is a very, very important one. And it can happen just shift by shift. Brilliant. It's so interesting that the, the magnifying the tendencies, exaggerating, and it's almost like a homeopathic remedy in a way. It, it is exactly. And it, and in fact, that's one of our nine principles in At the Speed of Life is the magnification principle. And it's actually my favorite because if you've ever tried to talk anybody out of their drama, it just increases the drama. But if you can have them exaggerate their drama, they can begin to see it's funny the, the, the like, oh my goodness, look at what I'm up to. And also how could I be using my energy differently than in this? Because at the source of that, people are getting their energy from adrenaline. What I notice is that the, what Stephen Cartman called the drama triangle in back in the 1960s, and I call it the villain, victim, and hero that's the main interaction that most people have, not only with others, but with themselves. So blaming themselves, which is the villain, feeling at the effect of the blaming, trying to do something, well, you know, I'm going to get up early in the morning and I'm going to jog every day. And then all it just keeps circling around and creating more adrenaline, which is incredibly addictive. But if I can shift even for a moment into wonder, Hmm, which I have people do also with a very uh, 
small but very valuable move, which is creating a, in fact, people can try it on, creating a through the whole out breath. That shifts them into wonder brain where they can start actually receiving the messages from their body rather than keeping themselves different, distant. So creating a hmm is also a great way because the critical brain, I'll contrast it with hmm, which is what how most people approach their bodies. Hmm, what are you doing wrong now? But if you change that into hmm, even when I do that, I can feel my body soften and go, ah, more space more permission, more ease. Yeah. And it, it it seems like these techniques really are loving and playful. Yeah. And yes. I know you've mentioned that that play is far more effective than work. You know, so can you talk about that? Yes. In fact, there uh, this has always been my point of view. And I got into a lot of trouble all my life for playing in situations where people thought we were supposed to be serious. But I always thought that serious, you know, life is serious. Um, it's all made up, but it's actually not accurate that uh, any innovation needs to come with having some new shift in a, in a process that people have always been doing the same way. And so having people play, there's research that Karen Purvis did just a few years ago about how you create a new neural synapse, a new neural connection, how you get smarter, that if you're trying to create it with work, it takes 400 repetition to actually make the synapse. But if you use play, 10 to 20 repetitions. So it literally is faster and more effective. And I think at I think at the heart for all of us, we we come to the world from play and from curiosity and from wanting to reach out. If you look at any you know, animal videos, if you look at young children in a new situation who have not been traumatized, they will go toward interaction because they want to play. They want to toss, they want to... And the two favorite games in the world, peekaboo and chase. So... We all respond to peekaboo and we all respond to chase throughout life. Uh, and so if you can apply that to you, like how is your body playing peekaboo with you? You know, like I'm looking for you, all of those kinds of curious attitudes and welcoming uh, make a tremendous difference in your body telling you what's actually going on. For me, because I've had lots of medical challenges, for example, I had my knee rebuilt, completely rebuilt with bone and tendon surgery when I was 16 years old. And the first thing that they told me was, well, you'll never dance again. Wow. And so my body could have taken like, oh, and I just, I thought that just can't be, that just can't be. And so for about four years, I just looked at, well, how else could I do this? How else could I move? How else could I make this transition and really build a new structure? And we see that in lots and lots of where situations where people have had some kind of injury that seems to cut off a part of their functioning, but they can reinvent that by rewiring. And the quickest way to rewire is through your body. You make a different move. And that then informs your brain. It's we all we've been taught that it, that the information goes this way, but that's actually false. The information comes this way. A lot of what goes on in your mind, I'm really calling a body burp. It's your body, the impulses coming up, and then your mind trying to make sense of them. Yeah, and and you you know you've said this: the quickest way to change your mind is to change your body. And are are you referring also to kind of like program beliefs that maybe were introduced pre oh, Absolutely, because yeah. each one of those beliefs forms a, a structure in your body, the way that you hold yourself, the way that you hold your, your gestures, your facial expressions. And so one of the common ones is this. You know, if I, when I used to start 
uh, workshops, there'd be a whole bunch of people would be like, right. Yeah. And I could just see looking at all of this touchy feely stuff. But if I simply ask them to unfold their arms and open up their body, that opens something that is not possible from here. So from here, I'm all blocked off from, but when I change my posture, then it changes my perspective. And if we're playing with those beliefs, I'll also ask people what role or persona carries that belief. Like this one might be the skeptic. And so I'd have them try on a whole physical position. I'll just do it for a second. I'll have them like, how does your skeptic stand? And they might go, you know, they take on that posture. And I say, now, how about just making one change in your posture, just one change that you choose? And it starts to open up the logjam. And they start to feel a flow of energy and aliveness in their bodies, which I think is one of the big issues for most people in the world is they actually don't feel aliveness in their body. Right. And some people, when I was practicing as a therapist, people would say, I, I, I don't feel anything. I don't know what I feel. Or I just feel stuck. Or I'll say, you know, what are you experiencing in your shoulders? And they'd say, well, you know, nothing. So for a lot of people, there's just a blank down here because they've been living in their heads so much. So the combination of taking what they're doing, exaggerating it, having them make a shift in it, opening up more of their breathing and moving, which is part of our approach for my husband, Gay, and me, they learn that they have all of these different languages, not just this one, because this one is actually the last expression your body starts expressing first in life through movement. And then you start adding in sound. And so your movement and your breathing are your primary laboratory for creating something new. And I've just seen over and over again, people creating just these amazing miracles by claiming their creativity and by primarily loving themselves. And that means functionally to be in the same space with. So rather than being in their head and judging, like I used to think that I had giant thighs. That was one of my, when I was growing up, my brothers would tease me about my thighs. And my mother's response was, well, you're lucky you have legs, so, which was also not very helpful. But when I started appreciating my legs and letting my attention go into my thighs and feel them, I started going, wow, I, my legs are so strong. I can handle much more energy than other people can. If I have legs like trees, I can handle a big win. I can handle a lot of, and that's been true. I can handle a lot of energy. And so, you know, I'm just thanking my legs right now for being such a support for me in being able to handle big energy and be with people while they're going through old upsets and traumas that have happened to them, they can rest in the tree as well and find that tree in themselves. Yeah. And, and with people that uh, maybe have physical ailments, yes. Uh, do you, let's say they have pretty tremendous pain in the body and yeah. they almost kind of disembodied because it's just unbearable for them yeah. to be there. Yeah. What's been your strategy there or really the techniques that you can help solve well, it? Yeah, that's a very important question because so many people have either chronic pain or acute pain that then turns into chronic pain. And with COVID, so many people, including me, I had long COVID from, from getting COVID last um, January and it affected me in two ways. One, my temperature dropped a degree. Mm. So I literally got cold. And I lost my, my muscle strength, uh, particularly in, in my thighs. And so uh, I, I understand, um, you know, at, at this level, but I think it's true for so many people. I found that meeting that first with your attention and your breath, because those areas generally don't have flow in them. We've 
withdrawn our breath. Because also people, you know, when it hurts, you just want to kind of stop everything. And so combining very gentle movement with breathing toward and around an area that feels uncomfortable or stressed begins to loosen. And if I'm bringing both my attention, like my loving attention where I'm with, I know this hurts. Oh yeah. Oh, that hurts more. Oh, that hurts less. Oh, there's a little bit more space over here. Oh, I just found my breath opening more. Being with somebody in that journey, they can start taking off the layers a little bit at a time. And then finding what's the what's the best resting position for you? What's the best walking rhythm for you? What's the pace at which you feel most comfortable? And those are, are ways of moving that most people don't even consider, uh, but they make a huge difference. So for example, if I'm moving at what I call my essence pace, I'm aware of me and I'm aware of what's going on around me. And that allows me to stay safe, which is where a lot of the contraction comes from because we're trying to come protect ourselves and don't know how to do that in an expressive way. But if I've gotten in touch with, oh, I was trying to protect myself there. Oh, let's invent some different ways for you to protect yourself. You know, like really feeling your feet, feeling where your feet are on the ground learning how to move at a rhythm that allows you to be aware because we're not trying to have everybody just go blindfolded through life, but if, but aware of, oh, I want to slow down a little bit. I've actually had this save my life being on the freeway. And uh, because I have a practice I call loop of awareness where people can send their attention around, I caught an, an accident uh, happening up the road and nobody else saw it. I slowed down and moved over and didn't get involved in the big pile up. Uh, so it has both really positive uh, aspects, but also protective aspects. You're much better able to protect yourself if you're here <laughs> than if you're in your belief. So true. Absolutely agree with that. And the the being able to to um, kind of soften the guarding and protecting and all of that that's contributing so much to the body sensation ultimately is yes. a powerful tool and the final thing I want to say about that is I've always felt uh, that that the that that the universe doesn't like a vacuum <laughs> and yes. so whenever someone is not present in their body then that, that, that's an opportunity for like microbes to kind of set up shop and and take take control in a sense and so a lot of what i deal with is is people with multi-infectious disease that's creating problems in the body and right and and if if you can treat that but if you don't deal with the the original energetic right right it's like the container for all of that if you don't yeah. change the container you're going to get the same thing over again exactly yeah. yeah so so i just think it's such important work that you're doing and mm -hmm. you've even taken it you know beyond health and beyond relationships but but really about dream fulfillment like if you yes can be present in your body and yes time so tell me maybe well I want to show you I'm looking down at my phone for the purpose of showing you a new app that I've created that's free that's available uh on your app store it's called presence connect play and when it's so I, yeah, it's called Presence Connect Play. And what it does, you click it and it gives you an easy move to presence yourself, to be here, to connect with others, which is a major nutrient that we all need and how to play because most people don't know how to play. And so I just pressed it and here's what came up with so perfect. I love this because I didn't program this, but listen to this. So presence is breathe easy. So just breathe easy. And we have a whole structure for teaching people how to breathe easy, but just giving yourself the invitation to just ah, breathe easy allows you to get here, to presence yourself. And then connect is open posture. So very often people don't realize that they've got something askew in their posture, that something is closed up. But when I open my posture, 
I'm available to connect and I'm available to receive that nutrient. And then play says exaggerate. So it was what we were just talking about. So play is easiest to get into by exaggerating what you're doing. Because we always think the solution is someplace else. Well, if I could just learn what she's doing, that would be a lot better. Rather than the, the if I exaggerate what I'm doing, the answer is right there. And um, that was one of Jungian's principles of if you exaggerate and also if you let yourself include opposites, you know, I feel happy and I'm really pissed off right now and I feel happy that something else, a third thing will emerge, a synthesis that's new. So it's not as if you're ever going to arrive anywhere. People talk about what I call the myth of arrival. You know, like when I lose these last 15 pounds or when I, you know, when I finally get my divorce or when I'm making more money, then, you know, I'll have a good life. I'll be happy. But you can be happy right now by presencing and connecting and playing. And that can just be repeated over and over again. So rather than villain, victim, hero, we can have presence, connect, play. And that is my passion right now, to assist people in moving from that old, dead structure. If you look at anything that's not working, it's really organized around the triangle. And we can do that inside ourselves as well as with others. But presence, connect, play takes us into flow because we can just rinse, repeat. So presence, presencing with this and then connecting and then seeing what wants to happen. And we can do that with our own inner journey as well. And then it turns what we're experiencing into an adventure rather than, uh, you know, a slog. Right. And probably creates the opportunity for being aware of synchronicities and serendipity because you're there. <laughs> right. You're, you're, yeah, you're present. You can catch the, you know, you catch the moment instead of like, oh, <laughs> gosh, I wish I had. I've had so many experiences of right timing where I'm just in the right place at the right time. That's not only protected me, but it's also had an opening, you know, a, a new connection, something that I saw that I moved into that allowed a, a whole new possibility. Uh, I also, just as a sports analogy, uh, there was in one of the playoff games last weekend, there was the Chiefs and the Jaguars. That's just for the sports people. <laughs> um, the the f- quarterback was throwing the ball through this incredible pass, and the receiver he was there, and he, you see you see him catching the ball, and at the same time he's he does this. He was looking for where he's going to be moving next, and he drops the ball. So literally, when you where you have your attention determines your choices and the possibilities. And being able to be with yourselves in an embodied way has incredible advantages and also contributes to being more lucky in your life rather than, you know, mishaps occurring. Right. Oh my gosh. Yes, that's so true. Um, So what way would humans organize themselves? if you could get them to make one shift? I think the, the one shift would be to shift from fear to presence. And I've created a whole body of work about how to do that. It includes what I call fear melters, how to find your fear signature, how to use what I call fast aid for four kinds of fear so that you can apply it to your day-to-day life. But as I look around, every single problem that I notice, whether it's individual or global, has fear at its base. It's being run by fear. And in fear, first of all, I can't think because I lead my cognitive brain. And second, you look like an enemy. If I'm in fear, other people become the other. And that's the basis of all war. And so if I can shift my own fear, which I've learned how to do and taught thousands of people to do, shifting fear to presence, then the whole world opens up. And that's the one move that I would like everybody to make. 
And uh, your viewers can find more about that on our website. We have two websites, but the Foundation for Conscious Living dot org um, has a whole module that can help people to dive into that. But just right now, if you're in fear, you're probably not breathing or breathing fast, and you're probably not moving. So the very quickest thing to do is to just drop into your belly, just do a little gentle movement, maybe move something that you haven't moved in a while. I like especially to do with my face because people get really stuck in their faces. And I just felt uh, for both a flow sort of got almost a little tingles and felt a big breath wanting to come. So we can make these choices just one at a time to move from fear to presence. And then we get to be here more and more at the time. Yeah, I love that. I've actually seen uh, testimonials of people that have done your fear melting techniques and, and how it's just allowed them to do things they never imagined they could do. I know. I'm so delighted at that because I think everybody has, you know, something that they want to express into the world or some kind of creativity or a connection that they want to make, but they're just too scared. And that they can literally move through through that and turn fear into creativity. Ah, uh, such a deep power, and we label it as fear sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I think it's well. Fear is there to protect us, you know. And I'm not saying that we um, that we don't have fear, or that we should ignore fear, or just overlook it. But that fear is very often just held energy. And if I can be with that, then I get access to so much more aliveness than I would have. You know, because the fight energy can turn into forging and the flee energy can turn into readiness. You know, like a tennis player who's just ready for anything to come from any different direction, that comes from the energy of flee. And the freeze can be turned into a pause where I actually assess before I run. I can take a moment to, okay, get get wider and more spacious rather than being caught by the fear. Because often the pause is all that's needed. You know, like the pause before I step out into the street is a really good one. And then the one that I think most of the world is in faint, that a sense of overwhelm and just energy being drained can turn into engagement, can turn into reaching out and letting yourself receive. So those are the benefits of really uh, befriending your fear. Yeah. And it, it, I like how you also described it as containment. Uh, and it, it's like, it's such powerful energy wanting to flow in one way or another. Yes. And when we're just containing it, that's probably what produces the sensation of fear in the body. In the fear, and also in my experience, is a lot of what creates disease because we're not letting things flow. The circulation, you know, as we know, circulation is all. So when we're looking at, you know, at any level, what is not circulating? Is it a communication that's not circulating? Is it a tension that's not circulating? Is it, uh, is it a, uh, a a uh, feeling that I'm repressing and not letting, um, you know, choosing somebody that I can share it with who's really going to be available instead of, you know, I've worked with people who've been holding on to something they needed to express for decades. And with the befriending, when they do express that, then all of that energy then becomes available to them. It's just inspiring to see and be witness to. Beautiful. Well, given everything you've shared here today, what do you think is the most important take-home message about health and healing? Mm. Mm. I would say to look at and feel into yourself of what is wanting your loving attention right now, and then just let your body respond. So anybody who's watching this, just let your body respond, and then Ah, where am I getting? I'm getting right here. So I'm going to put my hand there and I'm going to let my attention go and I'm going to create my 
and I can feel my hmm under my hand and the warmth of my hand there. And I just feel a kind of little, oh, my body's going, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I needed that. Those little moments of caring for yourself, I think, are the most important thing that we can do right now. So beautiful. Well, once again, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and contact your programs and educational offerings? All right. Thank you. Well, our seminars and a lot of our relationship work is on our Hendrix.com website. And that's H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S.com. And our the kinds of things I've been talking to you about today, dozens of free videos and ways to befriend yourself and to learn how to befriend fear are on foundationforconsciousliving.org. Such a pleasure to speak with you today. Such a pleasure, Beth. I'm just delighted to um, be able to collaborate with you. Thank you.